Hey, thanks for checking out this message. We truly hope it's a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you about how God's moving in your life and let you know a little bit how God's moving at Coastal. Take a quick second and fill out that online connect card at the bottom of this page. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you have a blessed day. Welcome to Coastal Community Church. Uh, great to have you with us today. If you're watching online, uh, welcome. Uh, it's uh, awesome in here. Uh, come and join us next Sunday. We'd love to have you. I know some of you maybe are out of town uh, or sick, uh, but for those of you who are checking us out online, come and uh, see the energy here in this room. We've got a lot of energy today, right? Woo! Okay, that was pretty lame, but uh, there, there's energy. Trust me. Okay. Hey, a couple of quick things. Um, uh, today is a great day. Just like Ryan says, one of my favorite days uh, of the year. We, we do it uh, at the beginning of each semester. It's called Life Group Sunday. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, but I want to say something about our upcoming series. Uh, so right now we're in the series called In the Beginning, kind of making our way just through the beginning part, kind of an intro uh, to the book of Genesis. A lot of people uh, kind of kick off the new year reading through the Bible. And uh, we just thought it would be a great way to start off the new year. But the next series, it starts February the 10th, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. And uh, it's going to be a big day, a big day. We're kicking off a series. It's, it's a great series for you to invite and bring a friend to. In fact, we as a church are sending out um, a mailing, a large postcard to all of West Ashley. It's about represents about 45, 47,000 uh, homes in the West Ashley area. And the series is called The Vow. The vow, V O W. And it is a relationship slash uh, marriage series. Now, if you're not married, don't worry. I promise you're going to get something out of this series. Uh, but in fact, many of you, I've been told, are looking to get married. So uh, it'll be helpful in that way, but it'll be helpful for relationships. So invite and bring someone to church. We're going to do a lot of fun things during the series. One of the big things that we're doing is we're having uh, a marriage conference, marriage seminar, the 22nd, the 23rd. Our goal is to have over 100 adults signed up for that. And I think right now we're right around 90. And so if you haven't signed up for that, go ahead and sign up. Uh, it's going to be awesome. And then that Sunday, the 24th, uh, during the service, we're going to give all of the married couples an opportunity to renew their marriage vows. And uh, as a part of the series, as a part of that weekend, you don't have to go to the, uh, the marriage conference or retreat to participate in that. It's going to be during the service. We're going to get people literally to stand up on the sides or come down front or in the aisles and uh, turn and look at their uh, their wife, their husband in the eye, and just repeat their vows after uh, one another. It's going to be great. And then after the service, we're actually going to create like a marriage or wedding reception outside. We're going to have another big tent out there. We're going to have music. We're going to have food, pictures. It's going to be a great, great day. So invite and bring a friend beginning September, or excuse me, February uh, the 10th. February the 10th. Now, today is Life Group Sunday, so I want to talk about that. Um, Coastal Community Church. We believe in community. We believe that life is better together. And so I want to challenge you today to take that next step and uh, sign up and join a life group. And uh, we, we make it so easy for you to do that. Last Sunday, uh, we had our catalog in the bulletin, so you go ahead and start checking them out. Uh, it was online. Many of you have already started to sign up. In fact, typically you can sign up uh, one of three ways, but you only have to sign up one time, one way. In other words, you can sign up online. You can sign up um, today really just uh, two ways. Sign up online or sign up uh, at the life group tables. Actually, I take that back. You can uh, sign up from your Connect card as well. That is the third way. And yes, you can. So everybody, do me a favor. Pull out your life group catalog. And you can tell that the catalog kind of follows along uh, the days of the week. And then there's a code for each group. LGUF, LG Workout, LG Community, LG FPU. And uh, you could just simply put that uh, symbol, that code, uh, on the back of your Connect card and you are signed up. Or again, you could go online. Or you can sign up at the Life Group tables today. So what happens on Life Group Sunday is that our service is pretty much the same of what we normally do on Sunday morning, except it's a little bit shorter. We sing a little bit less. I preach a little bit less. But nobody applaud. And uh, then, uh, so we kind of dismiss everybody a little bit early. And the intention is we're all going to take a field trip. We're all going to go out to the tent and check out the groups. And so just like a ministry fair, excuse me, just like a college fair or a job fair, uh, there is a table or a booth outside under the tent representing all of the groups inside the catalog. 
And so, in fact, it's so simple. We even have banners up that go Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all around the tent. So you could just go, you know, to the one that you're interested in or check them all out. Ask questions. The leaders will be there. You'll get to meet other people. And there's food. There's snacks at all the different tables. So a lot of good food. We got uh, drinks, I think, right outside the table, uh, right outside the tent. Uh, I think there's lemonade and water and paper products. But it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, this is key. When we dismiss you in here, do not go get your kids. Do not yet go get your children. Not yet. They are going to be doing their normal thing, their normal ministry, their normal uh, lesson and routine. And if you go early to go get them, my wife, our children's director, will have my head, okay? Because you are going to be interrupting their ministry. Now, in the tent, we will make a big announcement. Hey, it's now time to go get your children. And that's when we, listen to me, we do want you to go get your children, okay? Don't leave them. You know, go pick up those precious gifts from God and uh, bring them out into the tent, you know, walk around, get some food. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, we love Life Group Sunday. We love life groups here at Coastal. Um, it, it is the way, the primary vehicle in which our church loves, cares, shepherded, shepherds, all those things happen in our life groups. Um, you meet other people. Um, we tell people, listen, you can do anything for a semester. And some of you have yet to take that step of faith and uh, check out our groups. And I think this is the semester uh, for you. Many of you have been in groups for a long time, and you know what I'm talking about. You, you have the opportunity. We put you in an environment where you can meet, potentially, friends. And that's what people are looking for today. They're looking for community. You know, I think they, they want a friendly church, which we try to be, but they're looking for more than that. They're looking for friends. And I can't guarantee you that you're going to meet your best buddy, lifelong friend this semester, but I can guarantee you that we're going to put you in an environment where over time you will meet some good friends and you'll do life with people. So that's the quick challenge. It's going to be great. Um, but let's talk about uh, today, uh, this message, uh, in the beginning. If you got your uh, outline with you today, go ahead and pull that out. Let's take a little bit of notes. Uh, but I got a question for you to begin. Um, if you told a friend of yours that you and uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend uh, or maybe you, you and your spouse were having a DTR conversation or a DTR moment, what does DTR stand for? Anybody know? Define the relationship. Define the relationship. Uh, for those of you kind of uh, in you know that, that world, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe it's a little bit older of a term, um, but, it, but it's fairly common in relationships. It's a, it's a kind of crossroads, if you will. It's a, it's a critical juncture uh, where you have an opportunity in this relationship to move forward and take the next step, or take it to a whole new level, or possibly to, you know, cut bait and move on, you know, to not move forward. Now, today we're going to talk about a guy by the name of Abraham who had a series of these DTR moments with God. Define the relationship moments where he was invited to move to a new place of intimacy, a whole new level of commitment, or in a deeper sense of community with God. Now, what I hope you're going to see today is that I believe that you and I get those moments all the time. You see, you're not here by accident today. You're not here by mistake. In fact, I believe that most Sundays, we have a DTR moment right here and right now where you get a chance to possibly take this, this relationship with God to the next level, you know, to a whole new place, a whole new place of community to deepen your love with him. But the reality is, when you come here to Genesis chapter 12, and that's kind of where we left off last Sunday, at the end of Genesis 11, you kind of wonder, has God run out of patience with the human race? I mean, because so, because so far, I mean, we have really screwed things up through the first 11 chapters. We made a mess of things. Remember, we've been talking about that, that downward spiral of sin. And you kind of wonder, you know, is God's dream, this great dream that he had for community, is it, is it lost? Is it broken beyond repair? And really quickly here in chapter 12, you discover the answer is no. It's not. God begins again with a man by the name of Abram. Now, God changes his name to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. And uh, from this point on, I'm going to refer to him as Abraham. 
So God calls Abraham, like I said, to this, this series of define the relationship moments. And we kind of get to peek in on it. We get to look at it. Now, God forms what he calls a covenant with Abraham. A covenant. And uh, I want to give you a, a definition of the word covenant because this really is a key word uh, for the Bible. It's a key word for today's message. And it's a key word for really understanding what happens here with Abraham and with us. So a covenant is a means of establishing a binding relationship where none existed before based on faithfulness to a solemn vow. Okay, I know it's a mouthful. It means an, an, a means of establishing a binding relationship where none existed before based on faithfulness to a solemn vow. You could call it a blood bond of life and death. It is an all or nothing commitment. In fact, you might even write this down off to the side. It is a commitment on steroids. Okay? That's what it is. Now, through Abraham, something remarkable is now taking place. God, remember, uh, from our very first message several weeks ago, God who created everything, okay, created the heavens and the earth, he has chosen now to enter into a covenant, a binding relationship with an ordinary human being. God is promising himself to fallen, sinful people. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to take a look at several very dramatic encounters that Abraham had with God that really defined this relationship. And this is exciting. It sets the stage for God's redemptive purposes with you and me. So let's talk about a couple of these moments today. Define the relationship num uh, moment number one. Should I stay or should I go? Should I stay or should I go? That's typically kind of a you know, important conversation to have in a relationship. Well, let's peek in on this relationship. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And listen to this. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, God basically gives this single command to Abraham. Leave. He says, leave your country, leave your people, leave your tribe, your family, your father's household, leave everything. Leave everything that you think is safe and familiar. And where is he told to go? God says, go to the land that I'm going to show you. Not about you, but that's a, that's a little bit vague, isn't it? That's a little bit vague. I mean, there, there's not much there, not many details there to tell his wife, Sarah. And you wives, you like to know the details, right, ladies? I mean, you do, especially stuff like this, you know, you know involving the family, you know, where we're going to live, you know, things like that. I mean, in fact, I want you, if you can, you know, imagine the conversation that they must have had. You know, Sarah, pack up all your stuff, all your belongings. We're going to move. We're going to move away from everyone and everything that you know. Abraham, where are we going? Well, I don't know exactly. I'll know it when I see it. And then she says to him what any wife would say to her husband, I'm sure. Honey, what if we get lost? You know, how are we going to know when, when we get there? Who are we going to ask for directions? And Abraham says, we're not going to get lost because God's going to tell us when we get there. Now, this has really got to be the one trip in human history when a wife would say, where in the world are we? And the husband says, God only knows that he's actually telling the truth. Okay? In fact, I believe men, you know, this is why we don't ask for directions, right? We're just being biblical. You know, we're just following God's lead, right? We don't have to ask for directions. No. Now, you got to understand something. You got to really understand the choice that Abraham here is facing. 
Because sometimes I think when we read scripture and we pick, you know, we, we, we picture uh, these people in our mind, you know, we think Abraham is just some sort of hick nomad, you know, with nothing to lose. No, 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 no. I mean, this guy we know was prosperous. He was living in what they would have considered, at least then, as somewhat of an urban setting. He was wealthy. You know, he had accumulated all kinds of stuff, all kinds of possessions, all kinds of servants. He is known. He is, uh, he has all kind. He, he's wealthy. Um, he's respected. He's successful. He's secure. And then he's told by God, go. Go to a land I'm going to show you. Go into the wilderness. Go to Canaan. Go where you've got no land, no network, no connections, and no prospects. I mean, really, for all practical purposes, it is financial, vocational, cultural, and maybe, just maybe, even literal suicide. Guys, nobody, nobody in their right mind would, would do that. I mean, it just would not happen. On the other hand, there is this promise from God that Abraham is going to be a part of something bigger, bigger than he could ever imagine bigger than himself. And, and, and the essence of this promise from God really consists of, of, of one word that's repeated over and over and over again. It's the word blessing. The word blessing. I mean, God says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be blessed and you're going to be a blessing. Let me tell you something, God, you know, that, that same word right there, God is waiting and he is ready to bless you. He's ready. Now the whole story of Abraham here really hinges on a single phrase in verse 4. So Abram left. He left. And, and as we read those words, it's also important to remember that this man right here, he is 75 years old. And so he chooses to bet the house, bet the farm, bet everything on this promise of God. And at 75 years old, he takes this huge, huge step of faith. Now, stop right there for a moment. Let's talk about it. Let's ask some questions. You see, because I think sometimes when we're going through the Old Testament, we think, oh, this got nothing to do with me. This is a different time, different place, different people, you know, nothing to do with me. Well, let me ask you some questions. What about you? Is God asking you to leave anything behind? Is God calling you to walk away from something that maybe, just maybe, you've made an idol in your life? Now, let me explain that. Maybe, in other words, is there something in your life that you've come to depend on more than your relationship with God? What about this? Is God calling you to walk away from a sin? Is God calling you to trust Him? To believe Him? Is God calling you to, to walk away from a fear? To walk away from maybe a negative attitude that you've had and you've not realized the impact that it's having on you and those around you? Or is God calling you to walk away from a relationship that you know is not right or, at the very least, needs to make some changes? What about this? Is God calling you to go someplace? And you know that you know that you know what it is. You know in your heart. He's calling you to, to take a step of faith. It might be a leap. It might be a huge step. Or just one. Just the next step. Is he calling you to risk something for him? You know, maybe it's to, to serve in a new ministry, to get involved and serve in some new way. Or what about this? Maybe, just maybe, he's calling you to sign up for a life group today. And we've had life group Sunday after life group Sunday, semester after semester. Or maybe you've signed up, you signed up for like 20 of them, but you don't show up. Listen, God is always doing this. He, he is. He's always calling you to, to, to do this. You know, here's the deal, you might just not be listening. 
Because here's what I know about faith. The goal for us is not to stay stagnant. It's not. It is to always be growing. It is to always be becoming, becoming more and more like Jesus. God is always asking us to take a risk. He is always, in fact, asking us to leave something behind and to move forward. It has not changed. In fact, even in the New Testament, it says this, but one thing I do, this is the Apostle Paul, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, again, God is always calling us to leave something behind and to move forward, growing, changing. The question today is this, do you trust him? Do you trust him? Do you trust God like Abraham did? That's define the relationship moment number one. Define the relationship moment number two. The offer of a covenant, the offer of a covenant. God's desire is to enter into a covenant relationship with Abraham. And this is one of those moments that it really is absolutely beyond comprehension. You see, on the one side, God has everything. And we have so little. In fact, even what we do have comes from who? It comes from God. And yet here is God. He initiates this offer, this covenant with Abraham, and ultimately through Abraham to you and me. This covenant, it actually reveals the depth of of love that God has for you, the depth of his desire to have a relationship with you. And when God extends this covenant relationship with us, we face one of the most significant DTR moments in our lives. Now, in general, there's a couple of different kinds of covenants. There is the, uh, the bilateral covenant, which is basically a covenant between Two equals, two equal friends, two equal partners. But then there's the unilateral covenant between a stronger partner and a much weaker partner. Now, obviously, this is a a unilateral covenant between God, the, the stronger partner, and Abraham, the much weaker partner. Now, in unilateral covenants, though, and, and there were a lot of them in the ancient in the ancient world, the stronger partner typically had like an agenda in mind. I mean, typically, typically had, you know, something that he was, something else that maybe he was after, that he wanted, that he needed, like maybe um, water rights, you know, or grazing, you know, rights for his cattle, you know, land or something like that. You see, the stronger partner, you know, to enter into a, a, a covenant with a weaker partner, had to have something else that he wanted or needed. Now, so here's the question you got to ask yourself today. It's the obvious question. What does God want? I mean, what does God, the the stronger partner, get out of this deal? What, what, What is his agenda? Now, again, remember, he knows us. And he knows the human race. And so far, up to this point, the human race has meant nothing more than heartache and gratitude, corruption and sin for God. That's it. So what in the world does God get out of this deal? You, you know what he gets? You ready for this? He gets somebody to love. He gets somebody to bless. He gets somebody that can pour out the affection and the warmth and the love of his heart onto. In fact, that's why you read through all of the Old Testament and, and, and the writers were all blown away by the fact that God would ever enter into a covenant with human beings. Now, the key phrase to understand comes at the end of verse 3 where it says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You see, I think we have this misunderstanding today, you know, 2019, when it comes to uh, Abraham and the people people of Israel, Jewish people. You know, we think, well, when when Abraham was called, or, or when Israel was called God's chosen people, well, that means that, you know, they're God's favorites and uh, they get this inside track to, to favor with God. And, and that's not really all of it at all. I mean, from the beginning, Abraham and his descendants, his people, yes, were chosen, were called, 
but they were chosen and called to be kind of a model community that ultimately would cause exactly what it says here. All the people of earth, the opportunity to love and to know and to follow the God of the covenant. I mean, you could easily put it this way. God so loved the world that he made a covenant with Abraham that the whole world potentially could be blessed through him. In fact, even in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said it in Galatians 3.8. He says this, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Talking about us, non-Jewish people, okay? That we would be made right, we would have right standing before God by faith. And listen to this. He actually announced the gospel in advance to who? Who's it say? Abraham. When he said, all nations will be blessed through you. Guys, you ought to be blown away by the fact that our God wants to enter into this covenant relationship with you. It shows the depth of his love. I don't know everybody's story in this room, and I don't know how you felt when you came in here today, but I know you need to hear this loud and clear. Our God loves you. You matter to him more than you think you do. So much so that he was willing to lower himself as the God of all creation to have a covenant with you. You know, li listen, the Great Commission, you know, in church world we refer to the Great Commission, you know, where Jesus told his followers to, you know, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The Great Commission for all practical purposes, really started here in Genesis 12, 3, where it says that, that God wants to bless the whole earth, and he wants to do it beginning, starting with Abraham, and then through this, what becomes this model community. You see, his desire is not just to bless Abraham and Israel in and of themselves, just for their own sake. No, the plan was always to bless his people, and then through those people, he's going to bless who? Everybody. That, that was his heart in the very beginning. That was his plan. He didn't want to leave anybody out. And, and you know what? That's got to serve as a very clear reminder to you and to me, in fact, to every believer, that we have all been blessed to be a blessing. That's the truth. That's the simple principle there. We've been blessed to be a blessing. God has entered into this covenant relationship, this covenant agreement with you, and he's called you. He's called you to be his people. You're now a chosen people. In fact, in the New Testament, um, it says that we are God's chosen people. Colossians 3.12, therefore as God's what? Chosen people, holy and dearly loved. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a what? What's it say? chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. If you're a believer, then you're chosen by God. You've been chosen so that, remember, we've been blessed to be a blessing. You've been chosen so that, just like Abraham, you can continue inviting people into the family. That's our purpose as the church. You see, it started thousands of years ago with Abraham and it continued right up to Jesus, and then with the, the New Testament and the church. And so I think the question for us right here and right now is this. Who, are, who am I reaching out to? Who are you reaching out to? Who are you praying for? Who are you building a relationship with? Guys, listen, we, we say it. We even had a shirt with it on at one time. You know, We don't just go to church. Coastal, we what? We are the church, and we're on a mission. We have a mission. This is, not a, this is not a cruise ship. This is a, you know, you know this is a fighter ship. This is a battleship. You know, we, we're, we're on a mission to share and experience the life and the love of Jesus with Charleston and the world. You know, where, where we're extending community in our life groups, where we're extending community and sharing the love of Jesus, the life and love of Jesus, when you invite somebody to come on uh, on, on February the 10th, the new series. Now, you got to understand that to enter into this covenant, man, it is a serious, serious thing. 
In fact, in Genesis 15, 18, it says, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Now, the word there in Hebrew literally means this. You ready? To cut a covenant. To cut a covenant. And so when people made a covenant, there was this kind of gory ceremony, this kind of bloody ceremony that went along with it. And what they would do is they would, they would take an animal and they would literally cut it in half, split it in two, and they would separate the pieces and, then, and lay them apart from each other. And then they would go for what they would call the covenant walk. And they would pass between the pieces of the animal that had been split open and laid bare for everybody to see. And do you know what the symbolic meaning of that walk was? It's this. If I do anything to violate this agreement, this commitment on steroids, may what happened to that animal happen to me. In fact, it's exactly what the Bible says. Jeremiah 34, 18, listen to this. The men who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two, piece, cut in two and then walk between its pieces. Wow. A serious business. That's saying, you know what? You can count on my word, or may pain come to me. Now, as little kids, we kind of do something similar on a very, very lighter scale, okay? Uh, you know, if you made a really serious promise with somebody, what do you say? Cross my heart and hope to die. And if you're really serious, stick a needle in my eye. Now, you never did that, I hope, but, um, you know... And so when somebody would violate this covenant, listen, it wasn't ripped up. It didn't tear the paper in two. It wasn't voided. Uh-uh. It got real unpleasant for the violator. And in Genesis 15, 8, Abraham basically says, hey, God, how do I know that you're going to keep your end of the agreement? I mean, because God's the one that initiated this. And so, beginning in verse 9, it says this. Listen to this. So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. You see exactly what he's doing, right? And then in verse 17, I want you to notice this is so important. Who takes the covenant walk? When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the two pieces. Passed between the pieces. Now guess what? Who's that? Well, in the Old Testament, smoke and fire symbolized God's presence. Listen, this has got to blow you away. God wants so bad for Abraham to trust him, to enter into this relationship with him. He wants so bad for anyone, someone to trust him that what does he do? The God, the creator of all things, the universe, the creator of all, he lowers himself and he takes the oath. He takes the covenant walk and he says basically, hey, may it be done to me if I don't keep my promise to you now, as awesome and as unbelievable as that is, listen to this. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus has been living, you know, life, doing life in love with his disciples now for almost three years. He's with them in the upper room. We call this the Last Supper. And and he's about, at this point, to be arrested. He's about to take a beating, the likes of which you and I could hardly fathom. He's about to be crucified, to be put on a cross. And he says this to his friends. He says this to his disciples who are gathered there. He takes a cup and he says, this cup is the what? What does he say? It is the new what? Covenant in my blood. The new covenant. Basically what he was saying to them, and listen to me, 
They knew exactly what he was saying because they're Jewish. They knew the stories. They knew all about Abraham. They, basically what he was saying was the old covenant between God and man. You know what? It's been violated. And they knew it. They did. It's been violated, but not by God. Who broke their promise? Who walked away from the commitment? Mankind, you and me. And so they knew it. Somebody had to pay. A covenant had been violated. And so what does Jesus say? What did he say to them? What is he saying to us? He said, hey, you know what, guys? Here's the deal. I'll pay. I'll suffer. I'll cut a new covenant with my body. The blood that's going to be shed is going to be my blood. I'll pay the price and I'll establish a new covenant. Now, I don't think they completely understood everything that he was saying right then and there. Maybe it was a little confusing to them, but I hope you see this today. Because we can look back and see what happened. Now, don't you see? That's why communion is so special and so meaningful and so important to a believer. Do you see what this is? What it represents? What it symbolizes? It represents the new covenant. The new price that was paid. Paid by Jesus. This is his blood. This is his body. It represents those things. And so my question to you is this. How can you ever take that lightly? How can you ever neglect that? How can you ever take for granted assembling together like we do and giving you the opportunity to remember? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, of this new covenant. Now, I got a more important question to ask you, and, this, and that's this. Because we've all violated the covenant. I mean, the simple way to say that is just, we're sinners. We blow it. The standard's not me, it's not you, it's God. And if that's the standard, we all fall short. He's holy and we're not. We're sinners and we need a Savior. And one has been provided. So the question I got for you, have you entered into that covenant relationship with God? You see, the price has already been paid. You now enter it by faith. By faith in the one who took the walk for you. By faith in the one who shed his blood, had his body beaten was crucified, and he proved that he had the right to do it. He proved he had the power over sin and death by coming back from the dead three days later. It was witnessed by hundreds of people. It was recorded in human history, and it turned the world upside down. Have you entered into this covenant relationship with God? And it, Why does God want to do that? What does he get out of it? Somebody to love. Somebody to bless. You just got to trust him. Will you? Bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, today I do thank you for your word. I thank you for these stories that were written so long ago but still have application for our lives today. Such, such great spiritual significance. And God, I realize sometimes these words like covenant and 
you know, maybe they're a little hard to understand, but today, God, I pray that we brought meaning to them. I thank you that through Abraham, you established this relationship, one that you wanted to continue on to right now. For those of us who are here, God, who have accepted Christ by faith, we just give you thanks. Thank you for one who paid the price that we could never pay. And Father, even now as we move into a time of communion here in just a moment, we just, we don't want to take this lightly. We don't want to, you know, rush through this moment. We just thank you for Jesus and what he did and how he sacrificed for us this new covenant. And listen, if you are here today, listen, you're not here by accident, and God is waiting. He's ready to, he's extending this offer to you, and he's already taken the walk. He's already paid the price. He's just waiting on you to come home by faith, to trust in Christ. Listen, if you're ready, just pour out your heart to him right here and right now, and just say, dear Heavenly Father, God, today I believe. I do, I believe. I'm a sinner, I admit it, I've blown it. Today I walk away from all of that and I turn in faith toward Jesus. And I trust him as much as I know how, as much as I understand. I put my faith and trust in him and what he did for me on that cross and through his death, burial, and resurrection. And now God, for the rest of my days, I just want to follow. I just want to become. I want to be more like Abraham, God. I want to walk by faith and trust you and become more and more like Jesus, leaving sin and this world behind and moving toward Christ. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.